Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> Hello and welcome wrestling fans We are moving swiftly through 2023 And that means 20 years ago to this day Was Survivor Series 2003 Featuring two classic Survivor Series matches A Buried Alive match and an ambulance match to boot um, definite definition of survival right here in this pay-per-view and it's always one that I remember very fondly and it was also if I'm not mistaken the last time we had a proper buried alive match uh, apart from the boneyard match which is obviously pre-filmed during the pandemic this here took place on November 16th 2003 in Dallas, Texas, at the American Airlines Arena, and it is the 17th edition of Survivor Series. It is a joint pay-per-view from Raw and SmackDown, of course. The uh, attendance does look impressive, but it was 13,487, because obviously the big... Um, <clears throat> The big entranceways and stuff like that took away quite a lot of what they could do with the crowd and how many people they could fit in, as well as the ambulance and the grave site for the aforementioned matches. The main event of the show was also Goldberg versus Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. And I cannot for the life of me think why they didn't choose the Buried Alive match for the ending. Um, but there you go. Uh, so we roll on, and uh, this pay per view has the theme song Build a Bridge by WWE's favorite band at the time, Limp Biscuit. Yay! Uh, and of course, you've got the game Arena on the games. Not the game arena, I did that last time. Got the arena for Survivor Series on WWE WrestleMania 21. WWE Smackdown vs Raw. And WWE Day of Reckoning. Uh, so interestingly there, there was two uh, GameCube games and one Xbox and PlayStation 2 game. So, there you go. We'll get into the main part of the podcast. And therefore, the main part of the show. After giving you the results of Sunday Night Heat with the WWE Cruiserweight Championship on the line. And Tajiri defeating Jamie Noble to retain the championship. So, we move on to the first match. And it is Team Angle versus Team Lesnar. In Team Angle, you have Kurt Angle, of course. John Cena, the Doctor of Thugonomics. Chris Benoit, the Toothless Aggression Candidate, the Wolverine. The Yeah, it is the Wolverine, isn't it? Um, rabid Wolverine. Uh, Bradshaw... Fresh off the APA and Hardcore Holly. Um, in Team Lesnar, you got Brock Lesnar, Big Show, A-Train, Matt Morgan and the Colossus of Boggo Road, Nathan Jones. So this one kicks off really quickly. After all, the competitors are out at ringside and ready for their match. This one kicks off really quickly with a jump start. Hardcore Holly shoving the referee down 
uh, Brian Hebner and um, getting disqualified straight away. He is followed quickly by the A-Train, followed quickly again by Bradshaw. And then for a little while, we have a little bit of wrestling. Ha <laughs> uh, So there's, uh, yeah, seven guys left in the match three on four. Um, it would be uh, Nathan Jones who would go next. Uh, no, wouldn't it? Sorry. It's uh, Matt Morgan who goes next at the hands of Kurt Angle with an angle slam. Nathan Jones goes next with a, uh, a, a, a crippler crossface. And that gives the advantage to Team Angle. It's John Cena, Kurt Angle, Chris Benoit versus The Big Show and Brock Lesnar. Kurt Angle goes next after a wicked F5, low and tight. And Kurt Angle, the leader of Team Angle, goes next. Brock Lesnar, surprisingly, then is the... Next person to go, and again tapping out to the crippler crossface. Again, Team Angle is up one man. It would then be two on one, Big Show being the last man standing for Team Angle. Kurt Angle, sorry, Kurt Angle's already gone. Bro, uh, Chris Benoit and John Cena being the last two for Team Angle. Just as Big Show was getting the uh, upper hand in this one, uh, the referee was checking on Chris Benoit. John Cena comes in, hits Big Show with the chain and hits an FU, a version of the F5. And it was actually named... After the F5, because Cena and Brock Lesnar had a, a little bit of a feud. And uh, John Cena would go into the pin and uh, pull off the victory for Team Angle. The survivors in this first match are John Cena and Chris Benoit. Nice little show of respect at the end as well with a handshake. I'm going to give this one... Two and a half cheap socks out of five. Because it's the opening match. It's nice and quick. but And it, it, it has a reasonable structure. Obviously you've got Nathan Jones in there. Who is the absolute weak link in this match. Completely. Um, but other than that. Thoroughly entertaining. If a little bit quick. But you can expect that from a Survivor Series match. So three cheap shots out of five. We move on and we have a backstage segment here with Vince McMahon walking the corridors of the American Airlines Arena, trying to locate his son. Knocks on the door, walks in, says he is feeling spiritual, guided, protected by a higher power. And then it suddenly dawned on him that it's father and son in individual matches against two brothers. And Shane McMahon is feeling like he is sorry for what's going to happen to his father. Vince McMahon walks out of the room. Shane McMahon carries on warming up. Vince walks into Stone Cold Steve Austin. An exchange of laughter and then nothing. With Stone Cold moving past Vince McMahon and leaving him in the ether. And we move on to the next match. It is, in fact, a championship match. The first one on the card at Survivor Series 2003. It is the women's championship that is on the line in this one. It is Molly Holly defending against Lita. Now... <clears throat> It's difficult to concentrate on this match. It is actually a decent match, but obviously the, the commentary team 
of The King and JR. JR is very much calling it as a wrestling match. The King keeps going on about Molly Holly's lips and puppies. <clears throat> now, much like the Trish Stratus matches that he calls, I think that is very inappropriate. Obviously, at the time, it was more acceptable. You look at it now, it's definitely not. And in a world, a wrestling world, where women are second-class citizens and treated as such, which they shouldn't be, it um, it, it doesn't hold well uh, in the past sort of 20 years. So we'll go on to the match and the actual wrestling. You've got two women here who are classically trained. You've got Lita, who does all the high-flying stuff, trains in... Trained in Mexico. Very, very good. And Molly Holly, more classically trained. And uh, obviously both of them are under the tutelage of uh, Fit Finley, as he were back then. And he loves to fight. And he trained his women to fight as well. And fight they did. And they fought for their spots. Uh, early on in the match, Lita goes out of the ring and lands quite nastily. And Molly Holly follows up that with a nasty throw to the barricade. Uh, from here, Molly Holly is completely on top of this match. He uh, slows it down a little bit, keeps Lita grounded, which is absolutely sound. Sound strategy. The... Comeback would be in the form of Lita getting a few shots in, using her quickness to get a uh, a, a near fall with a roll up uh, for Molly Holly to kick out. Molly Holly would then crawl into the corner and take off the turnbuckle pad. This is where we'd see Lita come unstuck because she would go for Molly Holly. Molly Holly would duck out of the way and Lita would smash her face on the turnbuckle. And it looked quite nasty, to be fair. But we then get the pinning combination for the win. And Molly Holly retains by hook or via crook. You decide. Uh, it was a well-placed cheat, I might add. So I'm not going to take any cheat shots off for this one. Because I quite enjoyed the match. As it was, although again very quick, it was satisfactory in entertaining me as a wrestling match. And the women, like I say, were fighting for their spot at uh, Survivor Series 2003. And, and they did a very good job of that. Incidentally, didn't even realise that it's only been two years as of 2003 since the Women's Championship has been resurrected. And that is insane. Absolutely nuts. Considering that there's there's been like loads and loads uh, of women coming through. They were all clearly valets or um, had no you know, real reason to be there other than looking nice. And they were the divas. So it's good to see that the women are, are like I say, fighting for their spot. And, and doing a damn good job of it too. I'm going to give this two and a half cheap shots out of five. We move on to the next match. It is the first big marquee match of the night. And it is the ambulance match between Shane McMahon and Kate. So the basic premise of this match is to incapacitate your opponent as much as possible. So much so that you could put your opponent into the back of an ambulance, shut the doors and send them to the hospital. That is the goal in this match. Now, Shane obviously giving up a lot of power, but he does make up for it with speed. 
Kane makes his entrance. The ambulance is precariously placed in between the sets of pyro, which I did think was quite, um, yeah. Um, and uh, the ambulance does react quite slowly, but it does move out of the way of the pyro. Obviously, Kane's pyro being fire and the ambulance being full of petrol and an arena full of people. Yay. Anyway, um, yeah, like I say, the ambulance reacts the, the and moves back after the pyro has been taken away. Uh, Kane looking longingly at the ambulance, rubbing it down and uh, walking out with a towel on his head. And that is just a, a, just a tea towel. Um, actually, no, it's a black hand towel, I suppose, isn't it? Like a gym towel. Anyway, it's a stupid look, but, you know... 2003 it worked for Kane I suppose um Shane McMahon comes out second and jumps Kane for a jump start gets a couple of shots in and then sends Kane over the top rope following him with that Kane takes a nasty fall straight on his head with this one it's a good job he's got well-developed neck muscles and knows how to fall when it comes to these things because he went over the top rope and just sort of stalled and then went straight down like an arrow straight straight onto the floor um Shane McMahon with the upper hand Kane obviously a bit miffed by this does throw some very strong strikes before pulling them again and uh, sending Shane into the steps Shane would then uh, crawl away as Kane would get the steps and try and hit Shane with the steps to which Shane McMahon picks up a chair and smacks the stairs into Kane's face. He follows that up with a couple more shots and then goes for the monitor. He hits Kane again with the monitor and sets him up on the table for the first big spot of the match and this is a Shane McMahon match so you know there's going to be some jumping off things and this is the first one top rope onto the table onto Kane drives the elbow as JR would say into the black heart of the big red machine uh, from here we uh, move into the crowd Shane McMahon has a plan as Kane sits up and uh, he runs through the crowd towards the grave site and, Sh and Kane is very much following and on the heels of Shane McMahon. As he goes into the backstage area, the camera tries to capture the action, but unfortunately the... Uh, they were not wireless cameras back in 2003 and uh, loses the feed. The crowd very annoyed by this. Uh, Shane runs away as Kane follows, goes round the back, gets Kane with a kendo stick and takes out the legs of the big red machine. He then calls in, um, he gets into the driver's seat of a truck and sends Kane through the window of a security booth. He then calls in a second ambulance, grabs the gurney out of the ambulance, tries to load Kane onto it, to which Kane comes back and throws Shane McMahon into the wall several times before heading out back to the ring. The action would continue with Kane very much on top in this match and throwing Shane all which directions, every which way but loose and especially into the ambulance. Throw Shane McMahon into the back of the ambulance, almost getting the door shut before having the door kicked back into his face. There is a moment here where Shane smashes Kane's face into the door of the ambulance by swinging it towards his head, unprotected, I might add, and he is now the mayor of Knoxville. So I wonder whether that had a bearing and an effect on his political career. Anyway, 
We then get the second big spot of the night as uh, Shane manages to incapacitate the big red machine once again, load a box onto his leg and the bin into his face, climbs up on top of the ambulance, goes coast to coast and almost, almost manages to get Kane into the back of the ambulance before getting kicked away and dragged actually into the back of the ambulance before being thrown back out again. It would be here where Shane would be the victim of the tombstone pile driver onto the concrete, much like his mum, who he is fighting for in this match. And uh, Shane McMahon loaded into the back of the ambulance. And that is your lot for this one. Kane with the victory. Shane McMahon heading to the hospital. I'm going to give this one four cheap shots out of five. Thoroughly enjoyable. Obviously, the hardcore championship is not a thing at this point in time. But this match was as close as we could get to that hardcore championship 24-7 style where they go into the back and all that kind of stuff. Very much gave birth to the uh, backstage segments in the games, in SmackDown versus Raw and things like that. Um, which is brilliant um, because we've got more backstage areas and all that kind of stuff when you play the games and more intricate backstage areas as well as we went through the series. So this match is is brilliant. It's a masterclass in how to put on a decent match with one fully trained professional and one semi-trained professional wrestler and neither of them bled just a little bit of firm bleeding from the mouth um which i'm guessing is a cut lip which is kind of nothing so very enjoyable no blood involved absolute barnstormer of a match we move on to a interview segment with josh matthews and Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar says he did not tap out. He did indeed tap out. He didn't tap out, but line up anybody and he would take them out right here, right now. And we move on to the next match. So we move on to an in-ring segment next featuring Jonathan Coachman, otherwise known as The Coach. He makes his way down to the ring wearing a neck brace and says that he will be absolutely fine after the brutal beating he got from the Dudley boys last Monday. He's also wearing a neck brace for added effect. So the... um, Owner of a local sports team is in the front row. I forget his name now. Uh, I mean, I'm not American and I don't follow American sports. Although I do watch the Super Bowl and obviously I watch wrestling. He gets interviewed by the coach. He says he can't wait to see Stone Cold kick Eric Bischoff's ass. Well, neither of those are in the match. It's five on five Survivor Series match and... They are on the outside and uh, not involved. Anyway, um, so Bischoff invites him into the ring, uh, gets uh, into the ring, pushes Bischoff on his ass and then Randy Orton comes down and uh, RKO's him. Apparently that's a legend kill. The owner of, uh, what was his name? Uh, I don't know, I can't remember. Um... So, we move on now into the back where the Evolution boys are celebrating with champagne and ladies. Uh, Triple H is about to take off his shirt while a couple of ladies rubbing him down. Ric Flair says, no, the champ can't get weak at the knees. He's got a title to win. Just as Randy Orton comes back and says, guess what I've just done? I've just knocked out a local sports team owner... And again, the name surpasses me, so yeah, <laughs> some kind of LA something. Um, Maver- 
Was it? No, 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 they're in Texas. It's the Dallas Mavericks owner back in 2003. I knew it was something along those lines. Anyway, so uh, he says that and then they toast again with the champagne and the ladies. Um, so we move on now to our next match. And as the uh, SmackDown announced team, Michael Cole and Taz says that their next segment in this show is actually going to feature the superstars of SmackDown rather than the uh, announcers. And that they do. It is the Basham Brothers versus the Guerreros or Los Guerreros. And the Basham Brothers come down to the ring with Shaniqua and her new balloons, shall we say. And um, they come to the ring in some very... Interesting attire, uh, featuring lots of leather and handcuffs. Uh, Shaniqua, obviously holding her uh, whip, uh, gives them both a slap on the arse. Apparently, that is a way to get going for a match. And, uh, yeah, we move on. Uh, Los Guerreros make their way down to the ring in their usual fashion, featuring a low rider from a local garage. And uh, we get into the match. So the Bashams are defending here and use Shiniqua very, very heavily. Uh, the Guerreros high-flying, the Bashams, uh, as it says on the tin, like to bash them up. And, uh, yeah, they're more sort of grounded and stronger, I would say. Um, so the Guerreros, great tag teaming, um, using their high-flying techniques, their, their lucha techniques, the lots of head scissors takedowns and things like that. Uh, and Shaniqua getting heavily involved in the match, body slamming Eddie Guerrero on the outside after being taken out. The Guerreros do set up Shaniqua after, a, um, after an interference for a frog splash. Eddie Guerrero hits that, Shaniqua is, is down. Uh, just as Chavo Guerrero goes for a spinning DDT, hits Eddie Guerrero on the back of the head because the referee's completely lost it by this point. And, uh, yeah, takes Eddie Guerrero out. Doug Basham then rolls up Chavo Guerrero, grabs a handful of tights and retains the SmackDown Tag Team Championships or the WWE Tag Team Championships as they were known then. a Pretty much an exact replica, replica of the old championships, only with a hint of blue. And they are beautiful championships. Same as the Raw championships at this point in time as well. But you don't see them on this show, which is interesting. So, this match was very quick. Again, the structure was fine. Um... The interference wasn't too heavy, but she did get involved uh, physically, which is good, uh, I think, because that's, that's the way she's being portrayed as a sort of physical manager. And uh, that is, you know, that, that's a good thing. And because uh, there isn't many managers that do that. He gets, she gets, uh, Schneekel gets involved as a physical manager. I'm going to give this one two cheap shots out of five. I feel like it could have been given a bit longer, but for the ambulance match and the buried alive match and the world championship match, there wasn't much time. Um, I mean, this is the last championship match before the world championship match, I think. Uh, and we've also got a Survivor Series match as well. So we've got three more matches and, uh, well, more than half a card left. And we've already had four matches. But the next three matches would take up quite a bit of time. Uh, like I said, two cheap shots out of five and we move on. So we move on now to the first big marquee match of the night and it is absolutely huge it is Eric Bischoff's team versus Stone Cold's team and if Stone Cold's team doesn't come out on top Stone Cold is gone he is fired 
from the WWE, fired from his role as 50-50 general manager of Raw. Eric Bischoff, it's kind of like a, a loser leaves town time thing. And, uh, well, it is Booker T, the Dudley Boys, RVD and Shawn Michaels for Stone Cold. <clears throat> and Eric Bischoff's assembled a team of YTJ, Chris Jericho, Christian, Mark Henry, Randy Orton. And the last person which absolutely eludes me. And I will remember eventually. Um, so, oh, Scott Steiner, of course. Yeah, <laughs> because it would be Scott Steiner that would get eliminated first. That's why I can't remember. But he is accompanied back to the ring by Stacey Keebler. Stacey Keebler is unwilling at this point, obviously, uh, coming down and being the manager of... Scott Steiner, Scott Steiner turning heel, that whole feud with Test and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, let's crack on, shall we? Um, so, yeah, five on five, traditional Survivor Series match. And if you're very new to wrestling, you probably won't know what a traditional Survivor Series match is because they very rarely use them these days, unless it's the SmackDown versus Raw five on five elimination sort of warfare thing. Um, so a five on five elimination match is your Survivor Series with the idea being that the survivors are the sole survivors. The very first Survivor Series going back in history, the very first one was uh, a load of these matches with the survivors on each team going into the last match. And it was a bit of a cluster. They even had a five on five tag team elimination which was like 20 guys around the outside of the ring and it made absolutely no sense. And I'd be really miffed if I bought a ticket to that. Thank goodness they haven't done that since. But, oh, right, let's get on to the match. First elimination is Big Papa Pump, Scott Steiner. He leaves after Stacey Keebler tries to get the crowd behind Booker T in the, as he gets put in the Steiner recliner. He is distracted and... He is subsequently eliminated from the match after a bit of interference and a, and a finish. Um, feel sorry for the referee in this one, obviously, as in all Survivor Series matches. It's quite a difficult task to control 10 people in the ring as well as managers and people on the outside. Uh, Book T, unfortunately, would go next. Um, he would be eliminated and we're down then to uh, four on each side mark henry would go followed quickly by rvd and devon dudley it is now three on two it is bubba ray and Shawn michaels for stone cold's team and it is the legend killer as well as y2j and christian on Bischoff's team they would then go ahead and eliminate Bubba Ray Dudley leaving Shawn Michaels on his own and this is where the hijinks started coming in because after a referee distraction Y2J would pull Shawn Michaels out of the ring and Christian would uh, monkey flip him into the post Shawn Michaels would then start bleeding. I use air, inverted commas, for that. He would start bleeding. And that would be the crux of the match. It would be losing a lot of blood. And uh, it would be three on two. Uh, sorry, three on one. Shawn Michaels does battle back, though. Eliminating both Chris Jericho and Christian with the sweet chin music. And... It would then be Shawn, uh, Shawn Michaels and the legend player Randy Orton left in the ring. Uh, no one ever thought it would come down to a one-on-one. -on -one. When it went three-on-one, you would have thought the survivors would be three on Eric Bischoff's team. 
But this happens to be one of the best Survivor Series matches that I've seen for a very long time and since this point. So, Shawn Michaels, Randy Orton. Uh, Shawn Michaels would go for the sweet, shin, sweet Chin music, not Shin music, that is Mankind's speciality. Sweet Chin music, Eric Bischoff would climb in the ring, interfere, kick Shawn Michaels in the stomach. Stone Cold would then get involved and take out Eric Bischoff. They would battle up the ramp. I say battle, I mean Stone Cold would be beating Eric Bischoff up the entrance way. And uh, as the referee was down, Batista, the animal, Batista, Evolution's animal, would roll into the ring, give Shawn Michaels the most devastating Batista bomb I've seen for a very long time. And Randy Orton would crawl into the cover after being stunned by Stone Cold Steve Austin and almost flying out of the ring. Austin would be distracted with Eric Bischoff. He was having too much fun beating him up. One, two, three, very laboured by the referee, but you can't argue with the facts. Once that hand comes down for the third count, that is the end of the match. And subsequently, in this storyline, the end of Stone Cold Steve Austin in WWE. Um... And quite rightly, Stone Cold would run back to the ring, give Shawn Michaels all of the credit that he deserves for holding up this match because Shawn Michaels is an absolute boss in this match. And uh, although the eliminations came quick and fast up to the last four, it was an incredible, incredibly enjoyable match. And I was talking to uh, a fellow uh, wrestler, um, about the characters, the storylines that wrestling produces and certainly WWE in 2003 was producing some really good edge of your seat. Need to watch it the next, next, next day. Need to watch it the next week. Need to watch it the next month. Television. And this was no different. Um... It was the man versus the people who go against the man. And it, it's just, it kind of recaptured that Attitude Era thing, um, which got so many people interested in wrestling and subsequently saved the WWE uh, and made it what it is today, which is why people look so fondly back on the Attitude Era. But I got to say, I love the Ruthless Aggression Era and this is, this is the Ruthless Aggression Era. So I'm going to give this match four cheap shots out of five. Just because it's a bit of a cluster. I mean, it always will be with Survivor Series matches, the referee and only one referee, which is I always find a bit weird uh, with these matches. Uh, having been in multi-person matches, they're not as fun <laughs> as people may think they are. Because you've all got to get stuff in and it's really quite difficult to keep track of things. But they do very well here. And uh, like I say, four cheap shots out of five. Very enjoyable. It is the second Survivor Series match on this card. And this one had a lot more for it than the first one. Although the first one told a very good story as well. We move on to the next match. Okay, so we move on to the pre-main event and something that I thought should have actually been the main event but was not. It is the second marquee match of the night. It is the Buried Alive match and if memory serves me correctly, certainly in WWE there has not been another Buried Alive match since 2003. So we're talking 20 years I mean, we could argue that the Boneyard match was basically a Buried Alive match, but that was pre-taped and it wasn't live as the Buried Alive matches were. So it is The Undertaker versus Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Vince has been a thorn in The Undertaker's side. The devil on his shoulder stabbing him in the back 
for months, costing him championship titles, costing him victories, number one contenderships, and so much more. Not only that, he's been terrorising his own family and that the lives of the other wrestlers as well. So The Undertaker, being the big dog, stepped in. And he said that if Vince wins, Undertaker dies. But if The Undertaker wins, no more trouble from the boss. And there you have it. You have a Buried Alive match. The only way to end a feud as big as this. We're talking over 20 years in the making. They made a big deal out of the Vince McMahon versus Hulk Hogan feud. This is probably bigger. Vince bought The Undertaker in from WCW when he was mean Mark Callis. Gave him this character that was timeless and lasted another 20 years past this mark and he always managed to invent himself reinvent himself come out with new things and this was his renaissance so let's get on to the match basically it's the undertaker kicking the snot out of vince mcmahon for a good 10 15 minutes vince gets no offense in here at all ends up bleeding profusely all over the mat, all over the outside flooring and all over the announce tables and everything else in between. And this all happened round ringside, so that's pretty cool for the fans that paid for ringside seats because the grave site, the site that's with a payloader above it, was ominous. There's a gravestone by the grave site with both names on it. One of these guys is going to get covered fully in soil. So the Undertaker carries on beating the snot out of Vince McMahon before Vince manages to get hold of a shovel after low-blowing the Undertaker. This is it. He only gets about three shots in. He low-blows him. He gets hold of the shovel and smashes the Undertaker in the face. Undertaker falls backwards into the grave. Undertaker comes back, gets his own back on Vince McMahon, and Vince McMahon ends up in the grave. It is at this point where the Undertaker heads to the top of the payloader, climbs the stairs to get into the cab, and there's an explosion. Undertaker is blinded, he falls back downwards, he's very close to being in the grave again as Vince McMahon clambers his way out. And none other than the big red machine, Kane, climbs out of that cab and continues to beat down on his own brother. So much so that the Undertaker falls backwards into the grave. He is completely out at this point. The explosion has knocked him for six. He tells Vince to climb into the payloader. The payloader tips and buries the Undertaker alive. Bit of a rubbish finish, I'm not going to lie to you. After the beating that Vince McMahon had... I would have liked to have seen this go a bit longer. But that being said, in my memory, this lives on. And my memory is rubbish. I always remember this match as being one of the best. Having watched it again, probably not. But for the spectacle, it is. For the fact that it doesn't come out very often. And for my memory, hasn't come out since. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is a special match. And like I say, it does lead to something bigger. The long-term plan. So your winner of this match, burying The Undertaker alive with some help from the big red machine, Kane, is Vince McMahon. So in the space of two months, he's taken out his own daughter. 
the general manager of SmackDown. He's taken out one of his biggest, longest rivals in The Undertaker. He's been business partners with The Undertaker. He has been rivals with The Undertaker. He has done everything with The Undertaker. Or maybe not everything, but, you know, it is Vince McMahon. Who knows? It deserved a bit of a big, bigger payoff, I think. But, the, like I say, the spectacle of the match told a better story than uh, having a 30-minute technical masterpiece. And for that reason alone, I'm going to give this four cheap shots out of five. Still an incredibly enjoyable match. Not a big fan of the amount of blood that's involved in this and clearly there's some blading here because no one would bleed that much without a clean cut no one um so yes four cheap shots out of five a little bit of interference but you'd expect that from the boss you know he can just pull his wallet out and say can you do this for me and they'll do it and there you go Vince McMahon is your winner and we move on to the next match. It is the main event of the evening for Survivor Series. And it is for the World Heavyweight Championship. It is Goldberg defending against Triple H. Who is earlier in the night was partying. Preempting that he was going to win this one. Now obviously there's an issue there. <laughs> Because Triple H matches in 2003 weren't that good anyway. And this is no different. Um, I'm going to make this one short. Because there was very little that was memorable about this match. Um, Goldberg retains after some interference from all members of Evolution. He takes out everybody with Triple H's own sledgehammer after the referee gets knocked down, and then proceeds to spear Triple H and jackhammer him for the win. Really bad match. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, for a, for a main event of a pay-per-view, this is not good. Um... You know, there's a couple of matches that probably could have taken the main event slot. I don't feel like this was the one to do that. Either the, the give the Buried Alive match a bigger spot or the Stone Cold Eric Bischoff uh, Survivor Series um, Survivor Series match. <sighs> Maybe I'm being too harsh on this, but like I say, Triple H matches in 2003 were not good. Goldberg was just there for a paycheck and you could tell. So I'm going to have to give this a low mark and I'm going to give it two cheap shots out of five. The amount of interference was there to take away how much it actually stank up the place and the fact that it was a main event. But not only that, like I say, you've got Triple H who was gifted but not bothered at this point in time. It's just like, yeah, I'm I'm married I married the boss's daughter, I'm untouchable. And then you've got Goldberg, like I say, he's just there for a paycheck. And people knew this. It was the age and the dawning of the internet wrestling fan. Obviously it had been around for a little while, but this was the point where things were vastly available. And, you know, from video game, you know, creator characters, where you could create characters that weren't in the video games for having tutorials and things like that, um, to, you know, internet dirt sheets. And there were dirt sheets, there's always been dirt sheets, but they were always printed. Internet, instant, instant dirt sheets. And this was the point where it turned. It was still very enjoyable. The whole pay-per-view was very enjoyable. But that last match, just... I feel like it could have gone on earlier and swapped round with 
the Survivor Series match. <laughs> Stone Cold versus Eric Bischoff. And I think that would have had a bit bigger payoff and the fans would have gone home a lot happier with that being the last match because obviously Stone Cold came out, gave them you know, the, everything they needed. And there's a big thing about Shawn Michaels walking away with Stone Cold through the curtain together, even though it was the match with Stone Cold that caused Shawn Michaels to have his, Shawn Michaels to semi-retire. Um, obviously, it was hurting before that, but, you know, that was the match. So they, these two had history, and that was, to me, a bigger story than Goldberg versus Triple H. But there you go. I don't make those decisions, and the decision was made. Doesn't take away from a really good pay-per-view. This pay-per-view is fire. It is good. Uh, from start to finish, it is really, really good. A couple of bits here and there, like I say, the, the main event and the uh, SmackDown Tag Team Championships. Although decent, not great. Um, but there you go. That's that's that. And uh, that was Survivor Series 2003. So we move on to Armageddon and a very special episode of Smackdown from Baghdad. And uh, we'll review both of those before the end of 2023. Today marks 20 years since Survivor Series 2003. I hope very much that you've enjoyed the podcast and my thoughts on this pay-per-view if you've seen the pay-per-view, if you have good memories of the pay-per-view, if you were there, let me know on social media, X, Facebook and Instagram. I'm starting to get the hang of that now and not calling it Twitter like I used to do. Anyway, I'll see you then, Graps fans. Goodbye. <laughs>